This is the Volleyball Coaching Wizards podcast, covering everything coaching. Motivated and inspired by interviews and conversations with some of the world's great volleyball coaches. To learn more about the project, visit VolleyballCoachingWizards.com. Now here are your hosts, John Foreman and Mark Lebedew. Welcome to episode two of the podcast. This uh, time we'll be talking about the the development of a coaching staff, um, as discussed in the interview of uh, Vital Heinen. Vital is currently the German national team men's coach, uh, who won the bronze medal at the World Championships in 2014. Uh, as a professional coach at the club level, he's won four league titles, five cups, and four super cups in Belgium. Uh, won two CEV cup medals. He's also coached in Poland and Turkey, and was a professional player on, in, in his own right for several years. So uh, here's what Vitel has to say, and then uh, Mark and I will kind of follow on. You mentioned before that you like to, to delegate to at least the, the conditioning coach, the strength coach. What's the, your philosophy about the different staff members and, and how you work with them? Oh, no, 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 it's diff that's too difficult because you can judge me, Mark. <laughs> and that's way you were working with me like a couple of months. Um, of course, I like that staff members are having own responsibilities and can do things. But on the other hand, I know that people see me and also staff see me as a guy who wants to know everything. Mm -hmm. and so there is a bit of contradiction. I, I like to give away. I feel it's giving away, but for some guys, of course, it will not be n enough. At the end, I have to be fair, I always want to, to know what's going on uh, in, in that way. I think my staff can have the feeling they can do some things, but I, I will not leave it completely alone. Yep. Uh, that, that, that's true. I will always have like a half eye on it and go in and talk and do so there. But I think it's very important what is about staff for me is important is that you find people around you who know more than, than me, who know, who know somewhere more than me. That's for me very crucial. Yeah. I don't want a copy behind me. I want a guy who can be used as a mirror. I can talk to, and he can give a reflection about the things we are doing. Yeah. So the the guys and staff has to have a quality I don't have, and that can be on different aspects. Can be on knowing the game. Can be on scouting. Can be on physical training. Can be on physio. But they have to be better than I am. Otherwise, there's no sense. Otherwise, I will do it. And then it's also easier for me sometimes to give things away if I know they are clearly better than I. Yeah, yeah, and the, also there, I'm, I'm naive. I think I'm naive. I love it to say it and also to do it, like give it away and we will see where we end. Eh? I love to get very good and had the, 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 the luck in the German national team to have fantastic assistant or second coach or how you know that, know that guys around me to help me and give me a better view of the team. I think you're one of them. I had Santilli last year. I have Roberto Piazza now. I had Stefan Hübner there. So it's a group of guys who can tell me something I don't know. And that's, that's my meaning about the staff. They have to tell you something different. The most important I forgot is they have to be honest. Mm -hmm. that, that is a starting point that is even more important. You need people around you you trust. If you have to ask yourself every time a staff member is doing something that he will do something against you or against the team, and then, then kick him out. I was doing this in Poland. If you have the feeling the guy was not really behind me, then you said to the guy, take your bag and go home. I, I don't need you here. Yeah. I, I think that this has to be, the, the be honest or to be open. You don't have to be the same opinion. On the other, completely different. A staff member can have a totally different opinion. It's no problem. But you have to be honest and tell it to me, his different opinion and not to others. And I think there the staff is, it's very important to have a good view a good few of the things. If everybody can have a different opinion, you can make a nice meeting. Yeah. That's coming a lot out. Uh, I don't want guys just running behind me and just imitating or saying yes, that I don't like. But it becomes difficult. Eh? It's something I feel that if you are some lucky to win some games, that people are not so honest anymore. Eh? I, I feel it. It's not easy. That's why I'm, I'm happy when I can, can find a real good coach next to me because they have mostly the confidence to tell something different. Yeah. Yeah. And if the coach are not so experienced or not so famous, they will always be like, oh, take care with this coach. Oh, that's it's not easy to find good stuff. It's not so easy. But uh, your 
it's not so common for in volleyball anyway for for a coach at your level to uh, deliberately work with guys who are experienced head coaches, for example. That's not something that you see uh, you see a lot of. In uh, if you look at the NBA, then it's it's common in the NBA, for example. But but in volleyball, uh, you, you hardly ever hardly ever see it. Assistants are assistants, and and head coaches are head coaches. Uh, I, I think the beginning of our conversation was telling that I will be the, I was thinking to be the coach who is clearly different. But <laughs> it's, 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 it's funny story. I agree with that. You know that when, not when I took you last, then because you were in Berlin and it was a bit half logical that I could take you as an assistant coach. Yes, yes. Because you were the head coach of, of the champion of, of Germany. But when I took Roberto Santilli, the yeah. federation was first not so positive. Yeah. Because they brought two head coaches next to each other. It will only give problems. And suppose that the second coach is better than the first, then we have an even bigger problem. Eh? And yeah. So in that way, we're afraid, but they are conservative. Eh? And I yeah. think that afterward, and with you, and with Roberto Santilli, and now with Piazza, it's only showing that we have more quality in the staff. Eh? I, if you talk about a concept, I was selling the concept to my players in the World Championship that we have the best staff of all the world. Mm -hmm. I think the players were buying this. They were believing very strongly in what we are doing, the coaches, I think. And that's that's important that you can sell your product and the players may believe in something like, no, we are always best best prepared for every game. Yeah. So in that way, I think it's good to have good coaches if you put in the right package. And on the day, uh, I told the Germans on the question, yeah, but what if the second coach is better? I said, no problem. I step back and I will go home. If there's a better coach for the team, I'm happy to do, to do the best that what's possible to give the coach to give the team a better coach. Yeah. It's not me. I have to work harder and get better and go home and work. So there, I'm not. I think it's this naivety to to be open to everybody who learned me so much. And sometimes I will maybe get problems with it, but I I, I can only thank all the people around me like helping me and telling me so many things that uh, I will not change it. I will not change. I will always look for people who can help me. Yeah, so that clip from from Vital is for me one of the most interesting uh, points that came out of his interview. From a lot of interesting points, I have to say, yeah. and the idea that the staff member uh, should—I guess it's a, a common thing for people to say that the star that a staff member needs to to bring something extra to the table, but. I like the way that Vital specifically said that uh, he has to know something that uh, I, the coach, uh, don't know. And while that's, a, in a sense, a, a really obvious thing, it's something that in practice is really difficult to, uh, to manage because um, people, as a general rule, don't like to be challenged on a daily basis and don't seek it out because it can be, uh, as I said, it can be it can be challenging, uh, it makes you think, it keeps you on your toes and perhaps that's one of the things that distinguishes good, great coaches from mediocre ones is that ability to um, not only allow themselves to be pushed but to seek out uh, situations in, in which they're uncomfortable. Right. Now, you, we've both been an assistant coach at various stages. Has that feature, anything like that featured in to how you have your experience as an assistant? Have, have your head coaches actively sought out your you to push them or to challenge them or, or whatever? Maybe it's my experience as an assistant <laughs> that uh, that makes that comment such an interesting one. So um, I've worked with Vital in that context uh, as his assistant uh, and he's he's correct he's he he doesn't shy away from uh, from any kind of conversation and um, he's uh, I guess he's human so he's not always uh, uh, happy about it uh, but it's been interesting to me that uh, he worked with me uh, one year and then in each subsequent year he's gone out and sought somebody who's uh, who's a head coach uh, like me not just a, an assistant 
uh, a career assistant, for example, but somebody who's a head coach and who brings those things directly to the table. And, and I've worked with assistant coaches in different contexts before where it's been the exact opposite. And um, uh, uh, coaches who don't want to be challenged, who don't want to be questioned, who have their uh, system I have a system, and there's nothing that uh, that can be done to improve that system. And as a as an assistant, that's just about the worst possible uh, working environment. Um, but best one is where your uh, input is is valued, and of course, the assistant has to understand the head coach makes the makes the final decisions and won't always be the decision that you want him to make. But it's a much better working environment and it's a much better environment to for, for success, for improvement, for performance is uh, where you're always pushing and, and, uh, and searching for new ways. Yeah, I, I can definitely relate to that because there, uh, there was a year where I was, I was working for a coach where, I, granted I was the new person on the staff, I was lowest on the totem pole, but I was never involved in any of the planning that went into trainings. I was basically there just to execute, which just drove me completely crazy because I had come out of a situation where the, the, the coach that I worked for um, actively involved me in a lot of things and it actually actively had me plan out training sessions myself to be executed in training that the two of us were going to run. I mean, sometimes I had to run them myself. But even when the two of us were going to be running the sessions, she would have me do it. So going from that to not being involved in anything but serving and hitting balls and you know tossing and things like that was just – I felt like I ran into a brick wall in terms of my own development. I mean, yeah, sure, I could, I could watch and observe and, and we could talk about things. But it seemed like every time it came down to practicing you know, to set up the structure of that day's training – it was, uh, John, can you go make sure the nets are set up or John can go do this or that or something, you know, menial tasks which just drove me completely insane. But at the same time, the, the other side of it is, as a, as a coach, there were times when I definitely felt myself pressing probably more than I should have. <laughs> um, and, and, and I can even think of, of times, you know, where I had words coming out of my mouth and I'm saying to myself, why am I challenging this so hard right now? It's not that big a deal. But fortunately, at that point, I was working with a coach where we were much more of a partnership than head coach, assistant coach, in kind of the more traditional sort of way. I think that's a, a characteristics of, a particularly a, a characteristic of younger coaches. And younger assistant coaches especially want to um, – uh, well, they think they're right <laughs> because all, coach, yeah, all young coaches think they're right and uh, perhaps push unnecessarily. And I know that uh, when I was a young assistant coach, I was exactly like that, but I had the, uh, the good fortune to be working with uh, Stelia De Rocco, another one of our interviews, um, who firstly wasn't personally challenged by it, which is a difficult thing to do and secondly was able to uh, guide me in the right direction and and never discourage me from having opinions but uh, at the same time again making making sure that uh, that he had the the final say and and of course he never did anything that he didn't want to do but but I always felt that my input was uh, was valued and and the, the same with Vital, uh, working with him, that uh, that those things are, uh, I mean, it's a much better working environment for everybody. And I think that from, a, again, from a performance point of view, if you don't have that environment, and it doesn't have to be with an assistant, it can be with a mentor, it can be with a, a member of the management, that, uh, that, environment where uh, ideas are challenged, where systems are challenged, 
then you'd never, you don't have the same possibility to to reach high goals, to have continual improvement. In some moment, sooner probably rather than later, uh, performance will, will plateau, and uh, it's you win some personal, some comfort at a personal level, uh, but you lose the opportunity to improve. Right. Now, you've, you've been a head coach, and you've obviously been in a position to hire assistants. Um, well, first first question, and this is more of a, a kind of a general question. When you're in a professional situation, as you are now, as you have been, how much, how much influence do you actually have on who is your assistant on the staff? Um, whereas, I mean, I, I know in a case like uh, an NCAA program, the head coach is basically responsible for hiring the assistant coaches. But the impression that I get on the European professional stage is that sometimes the assistant coaches are, let's say, hired by the club or part of the club, uh, coach a lower team or something along those lines. So how much say do you actually get? Nearly always there's a, a right of veto, but not always very much beyond that and um, there are there are obvious limits uh, one is uh, is a budgetary financial limit that um, most clubs most teams don't save a lot of budget room for an assistant um, it's not the the last uh, brick chosen put in last brick put into the wall but um, it's one of the last budgetary uh, areas and so there are those two things um, the, th the third one that's perhaps uh, more important is that in most places in the world um, the US being an exception perhaps Italy being an exception um, there is no career path or Coaching is not a profession, and so there's no career path for assistant coaches. So it's not that uh, uh, you can you can advertise, you can make calls, have seven applicants, and choose the that your most comfortable or the best one. Um, coaches are rarely full time; they're not rarely professionals, uh, and you're often limited to often, nearly always limited to the people who um, live within 20 kilometres, who are still studying or who uh, perhaps are working with the, the juniors or in some other um, some other function. So there's not the, the freedom to search widely for assistant coaches. Okay. Now, that being the case, and with the ideal of having one or more assistant coaches who are capable of, of pushing or, or being uh, some sort of expert in a, in a specific area, um, how do you develop the staff or manage the staff in a way that brings that out? That's a really good question, a really difficult one, because the um, the non-professional, the 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 guy who's there to help out his local club is much less likely uh, and perhaps much less qualified uh, at that level to uh, to make really strong judgments or make have really strong opinions, and um, they're also not always willing to uh, rock the boat, so to speak, and and a coach uh, sister that I worked with um, recently he uh, while he was an experienced coach uh, he it took a long time for him to feel comfortable in actually giving his opinion and um, I think that's also a function of a lot of uh, head coaches they don't seek the real opinions of others they want people to uh, agree with them so they feel comfortable with their decisions but um, are much less happy with uh, with being challenged and it's a human it's a human trait <laughs> that people um, seek comfort and um, 
uh, calm rather than uh, seek chaos and challenge and and uh, perhaps that's why uh, uh, that's why Vital has been so successful in his career. Okay. Um, circling back to what you said about there not being a, a real career path for assistant coaches, uh, as, you, as you said, in the States you can be a quote-unquote professional assistant, uh, and there are some people who have who've made, a, made their living being assistant coaches and, and haven't really had, at least from an external perspective, haven't seemed to have had the interest in becoming a head coach uh, or maybe just didn't want to leave where they were at and they were quite happy with their circumstance. Um, so basically what you're saying is if you're an assistant coach and you have aspirations of moving on to bigger and better things, then the path is going to be not to progress to a higher level of assistant coach, you know, either within your, your domestic league or as you've done in a certain case, move to a higher level competitive league in a different country, but it's more mm -hmm. likely going to take becoming a head coach at some level and then moving up from there. Is that fair? The few people that would choose coaching as a profession in, in large areas of Europe are, uh, looking for an assistant position, perhaps as a stepping stone, and nothing, nothing more. Um, but even even then, uh, if you take out, uh, I think Italy, where they have a, a strong uh, history of of professionalism in in coaching, um, even then there are so few professional coaches. Period that. Uh, that even a, a younger coach who chose the path chose the, the path to be a professional would be able to have a head coaching position at a relatively early point in their in their careers, um, in a lower league, uh, for example, where where they had the chance to to build up in that way. All right, that actually brings up some, something that I think Mick Haley mentioned uh, in terms of just overall coaching development. Because he said even if you're an assistant coach for some college program uh, in the States, he would strongly advise, you know, these young coaches to get out and get head coaching experience in some fashion, which is, which is relatively easy to do in the U S because the college season and the junior season are not, you know, concurrent. Uh, so somebody can coach their college team in uh, speaking to the women's side of things in the fall and then through the winter and spring can go coach a local junior club and get that head coaching experience. Um, a little bit trickier in the European structure, unless you're talking about an assistant coach who, as we kind of talked about before, is also the second team coach or the juniors coach or, or something along those lines, right? Oh, I think the, the structures are so different that it's it's almost impossible to compare in in the the US there are so many so many areas of competition there is club competition high school college junior college and they're all a little bit different they can run in a sense uh, alongside each other whereas uh, in in Europe the, every country has essentially the same the same system of uh, of divisions 1 through 6 um, yeah, based on a single club with its own juniors, etc. So um, there's no opportunity to work in juniors in one club and seniors in another. For example, you're you're always stuck. Um, but there are other advantages in that system as well. But they're stuck in in one club, one situation. Okay. Well, just just for clarity's sake, you can't generally coach in the same gender, a uh, college team and a high school team or something along those lines. Never mind the fact that they're in the same season. It's just not allowed in certain cases. I was thinking but, I was thinking more of the club the situation in the US that you can you can work in college and in a club. Or you could coach different genders. So you could coach women's college and boys high school since those are alternating seasons or vice versa. Boys men's yep. college and girls high school. And I, I, I've no yeah. coach done that. So yeah, you're right. They're, they're, the the way the schedules are structured in the states provides a bit more opportunity to coach more teams. 
Although that being Absolutely. said, there are there there do seem to be more opportunities to coach at the national team level uh, in mm-hmm. Europe because most of that work seems to happen outside of the, the normal club structure. The Perhaps the, the point that I was thinking about was the, the links between things. In, in the United States, particularly the club system I'm thinking about, is completely separate from uh, all the, the school versions, the uh, high school, junior college, college. Um, so there's a, bit, there's a big separation there, whereas in Europe, uh, everything is linked together. The clubs are linked together with each other in leagues that run, like I said, from from top to bottom, one to eight, and and uh, or seven or twelve, or uh, depending on on the country. Um, so I, I think that's the difference there. The point that the point you make where there is no link is correct. There is no direct link between clubs and. Uh, and national teams and the club and national team seasons run not completely but typically uh, separate from each other although the opportunities to coach national teams are um, are restricted to a relatively small number of coaches within a country <laughs> but there are a lot more uh, in general in general I'm just thinking, you know, if you're if you're a coach in the U.S., there's only one national team program, and there's 50 states. Whereas in Europe, you've got many national team programs because there are many states. So, yes, on a strict numbers basis, there are more coaching opportunities in Europe. Um, but that's not a major point. Uh, so. What sorts of things, as a head coach, do you find that you do and that you can do to help develop the coaches that you are allowed to and have the opportunity to bring in as assistants to get them to the point where they can, you know, push back or offer new ideas or whatever the case may be? It's not. It's not that. Uh, that easy to to manage to create that the situation. As I said, a lot of assistants come in uh, to the situation not looking to do that, um, and as to come in as a as a help as an assistant coach rather than as a uh, assistant coach. Um, different emphasis on different parts of the title. Um, the <laughs> The only thing that that you can do in the end is uh, is encourage is just encourage that feedback. And uh, as I said, the, my last assistant it it took pretty much a whole season before he really felt comfortable um, in in that uh, uh, with that role. And um, obviously, our working environment became uh, much. Well, working environment, our working situation became much better uh, when when we were able to achieve that. And I say we because it's not just a, a matter of him of him changing. Um, and that's the main thing: is just to keep encouraging, give uh, give jobs, give tasks uh, to the assistant. Uh, that are valuable for the team, not just time-wasting tasks, because there are plenty of those as well. Um, and uh, maybe it takes time, and that uh, to create create that environment. All right. Well, circling back to kind of the original idea of of being able to give control away or give um, access or, or input or whatever away. Do you think most coaches, and this isn't just volleyball, but most coaches in general tend to be control freaks? I think that most coaches become coaches exactly because they're control freaks. And they, at some point, they they want to control every small uh, small detail. And um, that makes it very difficult to work with an assistant to provide... Uh, to create that environment where an assistant's uh, input is is valued, and 
uh, if you add to to the control aspect that <laughs> that it's not just being a control freak in in a professional situation the uh, the job is not a uh, is not a very stable job and the there's also the control in us in many situations can hide a, a sense of fear or uh, trepidation that the assistant could work against that coach or uh, it it is the case sometimes that the assistant coach works for the club in the negative sense is the um, is the guy who uh, reports on the coach to the president uh, there are certainly those kinds of situations as well so um, it's a, a difference between the the real world and the and the theoretical world, I guess, and well, uh, the code. To that point, yes, you do hear stories about assistant coaches who intentionally or maybe maybe unintentionally undermine the head coach, and and part of it may be related to it being assistant coaches being more I don't know career oriented. Then, as you what you've said in terms of the European assistants, and that they think, like going back to the whole idea of they want control, they think they can do a better job than the current head coach. Chances are they're probably not right because they're they're young and inexperienced and whatever, yeah. you know, full of themselves. But you do hear stories about assistant coaches who, whether it be with the players or whether it be with the administration, in some fashion, have sought to undermine their boss, which obviously brings up the idea of loyalty, which I, I know came up. Uh, forgetting which interview it was, but we talked about you know, what are the good qualities or what are the best qualities to have as an assistant coach, and loyalty was very much right at the top of the list. Uh, uh, and could it have been the Mick Haley interview? I was thinking the same thing. It might have been. The... Yeah. Go ahead. So the head coach uh, has to has to have the loyalty of the assistant, the coach, the coaching staff, and this is the same in the team. And uh, this is probably a word that will come up a, a thousand times in the in the course of the interviews. It is uh, is one of trust, and uh, just as there has to be trust within a team and trust between the coach and the and the players, there has to be trust within the staff and. Uh, the environment is such that the the head coach has to trust that uh, a the the assistant will not uh, will pass on his message to the team, but um, also in a sense to to management, and that the what happens in the coach's room stays in the coach's room. If you if you want to 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 put it like that, and. Um, that's you'll hear often in from coaches in different sports. If you read the um, um, read different literatures, and they say, "What's the first thing that that you look for in an assistant coach?" I've I've heard it more than once that the first answer is somebody who doesn't want my job, and that if the person wants your job, then you have to fire them straight away. That's the the first order of business of the relationship between the, the head coach and the uh, and the assistant. Right. Well, to your to your point about things staying in the coach's room, one of the things that I've always um, spoken with assistant coaches when I was assistant or when I was a head coach or whatever was you always, as a staff, present a united front. It's kind of like being parents. You can't contradict each other, and it goes both ways. The head coach can't you know be out there contradicting the assistant coach in a public fashion because that destabilizes the assistant coach's relationship with the team just as much as, as if you went the other way and the assistant coach was the one contradicting the head coach. Um, so it's a, it's a two-way street. A lot of works both ways. Uh, absolutely. And I've worked in situations where uh, the, head, the head coach has um, – uh, I'm not quite sure of a of a political way to put this, but but uh, put me down in front of the team, and this is absolutely the absolutely the wrong way uh, to work with an assistant. So 
whatever happens has to happen in the coach's room and what happens in the coach's room has to stay there. Right. Okay, we're, we're winding down on time. Any final thoughts? Um, no, I think the, the topic of the assistant is a, is a good one. I think the, to go back to the original point, the, this speaks a lot to, to Vital and Vital's success that uh, he's not only able to manage this but actively seeks it out. And uh, I think that it's a great advice for all the coaches who are listening to this. All right, we'll wrap it up there. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode. For show notes and more, visit volleyballcoachingwizards.com backslash podcast. Got an idea for a future episode or want to ask a question? Send an email to podcast at volleyballcoachingwizards.com.